Good morning. I'd like to start by thanking my hosts for the opportunity to speak today and by congratulating Leticia Azcubrea and Concha Herrero Caretero on the splendid exhibition which they have organized. Experiencing the Mercury and Hersey tapestries displayed as a set <coughs> reminds us of just how sumptuous they must have been when they were brand new in the mid 16th century. We've already heard about the Brussels context in which they were woven, and later on today, we'll learn more about their design sources and the various artists and craftsmen who contributed to their production. In the meantime, I shall leave the 16th century in favor of the 20th century and speak about the tapestry's more recent history. It is a rare and momentous occasion to see all eight of Willem de Panamaca's Mercury and Hersey tapestries hanging together in the same space. As you know, the tapestries remained together as a set until the death of the Duchess of Denia and Tarifa, widow of the 15th Duke of Medina Celi in 1903, when they passed to the Duke's heirs. Four remain in the private collections of the extended family. Two belong to the Museo del Prado, one bequeathed by the Duchess of Teresa in 1934, and the other purchased in 1965. The remaining two tapestries had to cross the Atlantic Ocean for this reunion. Aglaurus's vision of the bridal chamber of Hersey and Mercury turning Aglaris into stone. Since 1941, these two tapestries have been part of the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. After the Duchess's death in 1903, these two tapestries were sold to the Parisian antiques dealer Raoul Heilbronner. Once in Paris, they were acquired by Jacques Seligman, who by early 1910 had sold them to Florence and George Blumenthal. The two tapestries reportedly cost $120,000, which is roughly equivalent to 8.7 million euros today, using the average earnings index. Not surprisingly, given such sums as these, the Blumenthal's art collection was one of the most significant in Europe in the first decades of the 20th century. From 1926 to 1930, Blumenthal published privately a series of six catalogues devoted to the various facets of his art collection. The Tapestries catalogue, which you can see here, in which his two Mercury and Hersey tapestries are discussed, appeared in 1927. At his death in 1941, George Blumenthal bequeathed 588 objects to the Metropolitan Museum. He'd already given our museum 44 before his death, and when his second wife, Anne, died two years later in 43, she presented the remaining 21 works to the Met. And this is just a selection of some of the masterpieces from the Blumenthal bequest. <coughs> Blumenthal was German and had not inherited his riches. Born in Frankfurt am Main in 1858, he worked as a banker and found his niche in the buying and selling of securities. Employed by the Parisian firm of Lazare Frères, by Blumenthal's late 30s, his phenomenal success was already the stuff of caricature, and he became the director of the New York branch. At just 28 years of age, Blumenthal had already been chosen by the legendary money man, John Pierpont Morgan, to work with him and Joseph H. Schiff to form a syndicate to halt the gold crisis which was on the brink of wiping out the American economy. They succeeded. 
Not only a business mentor, Morgan also impressed the younger bankers with his voracious pursuit of fine art. Both Schiff and Blumenthal emulated Morgan's tapestry collecting. But while Schiff was content to commission cheaper modern copies woven in New York, George Blumenthal spent part of his fortune buying the real thing. And in this slide here, you can see the drawing room of Schiff's New York townhouse, which is decorated with brand new faux rococo tapestries, which were woven in William Baumgarten's tapestry workshop in the Bronx in New York. So everything you're seeing here is early 20th century. These. Blumenthal and his beloved wife Florence set to work spending their newfound wealth on worthy causes and on art. It's worth pointing out that the couple lived most of their married life in France. It was in Paris that their hospital for sick children was built, that they gave to the Sorbonne, sponsored new inner city parks, funded prizes for struggling artists, and Florence established their philanthropic Fondation Blumenthal. And this is just a, a sample of the headlines of various newspaper articles from the period outlining the various gifts which the Blumenthals gave to the French public. Such a barrage of good works indeed, that in 1929, Florence was presented with the Légion d'honneur. Her husband received his slightly later. Their Parisian townhouse, glimpsed in the background of this portrait of Florence, was by all reports tastefully decorated with 18th century French art. Objects like these two charming tapestry upholstery panels woven at the Manufacture Royale des Gobelins after designs by Maurice Jacques. And this Beauvais fire screen, all now in the Metropolitan Museum. and this Tenier tapestry of the return of the harvesters, which had formerly belonged to the Duc de Tremoille and had hung in his Chateau de Serran in the main loire region of France. <coughs> During much of this period, the two Mercury and Hersey tapestries had been on loan to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and were published as such in the museum's bulletin in 1910. And this is just uh, the two pages from the bulletin of 1910, identifying the, the loan by um, Blumenthal, and you can see here in the caption, lent by George Blumenthal. However, by 1920, they could be seen in the Blumenthal's brand new large mansion house on the corner of East 70th Street and Park Avenue in the heart of Manhattan. Although paid for by George, the house was very much Florence's project. By all accounts, this must have been a wonderful establishment. In a grateful letter after a day as Florence Blumenthal's guest, the great architect, William Wells Bosworth, wrote to his hostess that she had made, quote, the greatest contribution to the art of domestic architecture in this country, unquote. The Parisian dealer, René Gampel, noted in his diary that, quote, her house is the only one in New York whose atmosphere is genuinely antique, unquote. Another visitor to the house, the connoisseur dealer de Motte, wrote to Florence that, pour la première fois dans ma vie, j'ai visité une maison idéale. So, what was so marvelous about this house? Unfortunately, the house was demolished in 1945, an event deemed newsworthy enough for a headline in the New York Times. Happily, however, a wealth of archival photography does survive.
Mrs. Blumenthal had designed the house around their art collection. So each room took as its focus a star possession. The heart of the house was this court, built around the splendid early 16th century marble patio from the castle of Los Veles in Veles Blanco in the Almeria, which the Blumenthals had purchased from Seligman in the 1910s. All the objects glimpsed in these photographs are recognizable and form part of the Metropolitan Museum of Art's collection today. The patio, so here we see it as it's currently installed in the museum. It was installed this way in 1964 and they made as much effort as possible to replicate the original arrangement in the castle. Facing each other across this space, the two Mercury and Hersey tapestries. Two terracotta armorial tondos, attributed to the workshop of Giovanni della Robbia, with the wolf basson and six plates of the squarci lupi, and the bull rampant of the Salviati. The splendid Florentine fountain with the arms of Jacopo de Pazzi, rescued from the Pazzi Gardens, which had been destroyed in 1865. This 16th century stained glass panel from the Carthusian Monastery in Leuven in Belgium with the preparation for the crucifixion. Here, the painted and gilded stucco relief of the Virgin and Child from Florence. Here, the great adoration of the Magi attributed to Jos van Gent, a rare example painted on canvas, which Mrs. Blumenthal had also acquired from Seligman. And the two great medieval Spanish polyptychs, the Virgin and Child with Saints and the Pieta, here, by the late 15th century anonymous painter working in Castille, and facing it across the balcony, the Aragonese scenes from the life of the Virgin attributed to the Morata master. And the list goes on. So this, again, this is just a handful of further objects which one can identify in the scene. So this is this hanging here. Here we've got these, oops, these French Renaissance heads here, uh, statues of the Virgin, and so forth. Even these numerous candelabra and wall sconces passed into the Met Museum's collection. Indeed, certainly in later years after Florence's death, George Blumenthal stopped using electric light in the court, but instead caused it to be lit only by candles and employed two candlemen who were solely occupied with the lighting and extinguishing of the hundreds of candles illuminating the cavernous room. Experiencing the space must have been quite extraordinary. In his memoir, the art dealer Germain Seligman, son of Jacques, evocatively recalled visiting it. This is quite a wordy passage, but I think it's worth recounting in full. Quote, Once inside, the impression of austerity was replaced by a world of the imagination, far from the material bustle of New York. It was a dreamlike oasis of beauty, complete with melodious sound of running water from the patio fountain, often the only sound of greeting. At dusk, the light from a table lamp opposite the entrance gave to the high, wide court a quality at once eerie and intimate, 
as it reduced the proportions and picked up the warmth of the blooming flowers, green plants and colourful oriental rugs. It is difficult to explain quite how so sumptuous and expressive a house could be so intimate. This was but one achievement of an extraordinary woman." Unquote. He continued, Florence Blumenthal moved around like a fairy tale princess. In the evening, she often wore Renaissance velvet gowns in dark jewel-like colors, which gave her an air of having been born to this superb environment where every work of art seemed tirelessly at home." Unquote. Next to the court was the ballroom, apparently decorated with 18th century flower-strewn tapestries. The Gothic hall, seen here, on the floor above, <laughs> featured this tapestry of the Hawking Party, acquired from the Charles collection in Paris, whence also this picturesque fragment came. The formal dining room next door centered around this tapestry fragment, then called the Charlemagne Tapestry, bought by the Blumenthals in 1912, and which had previously belonged to the Marquis Henri de Vibray from his chateau de Bazoche du Morvan in the Nièvre region of France. Another piece of the same of tapestry from the same tapestry or set, also from the Marquis' collection was in a private collection in Geneva in 1921, eventually obtained by the Walters Art Gallery in Baltimore, and thence by exchange, also becoming part of the Metz collection in 1953, when the two pieces were sewn together to form a huge composite hanging. So this is the composite piece. And this, you can probably make out, is the, the Blumenthal section. Finally, on the top floor of the house was George Blumenthal's study, in which could be found the splendid tapestry of the crucifixion, probably woven in the workshop of the great Brussels weaver agent, Peter von Alst. These details provide some idea of the exquisite quality of the weaving, and like Mercury and Hersey set, the wealth of gold and silver metal-wrapped threads. Blumenthal had purchased the crucifixion tapestry from the dealer's French and Company before 1909. It was formerly in the collection of the Baron Frédéric Delanger, who had acquired it, along with many other tapestries, at the sale of the collection of the Duke of Berwick and Alba in 1877. Only a year after the New York mansion was finished, Florence Blumenthal started another architectural project in 1921, back in France, a chateau in Grasse near Cannes, which featured an annex called the Salle Gothique, composed out of various salvaged architectural elements. And you can see the Salle Gothique here. Here we see the Salle Gothique under construction. And here completed. You might be able to make out this tapestry. Blumenthal acquired it in the same year, 1921, at the sale of Raoul Heilbronner's collection in Paris. And as you may recall, Heilbronner had been the dealer from whom Seligman had acquired the two Mercury and Hersey tapestries a little more than a decade earlier. Other smaller tapestries in the Blumenthal's collection included a set of four game parks, previously belonging to the Comte de Vauguignon. These three small picturesque fragments
and a marvelous altar hanging, loosely adapted from a design by Rohir van der Weyden, woven with silk and gold and silver metal-wrapped threads. The Blumenthal's had chosen wisely. The tapestry market during this period was a minefield. There was a new generation of canny dealers who rejected traditional warehouse-type premises in favor of sumptuous showrooms, decked out like the domestic interiors of the homes of Europe's <coughs> nobility, which their rich American clients were so eager to emulate. In Paris, Jacques Seligman operated out of the Palais de Sagan. In New York, Joseph Devine, another European dealer, built this unassuming headquarters on Fifth Avenue. The third in the triumvirate of the most successful early 20th century tapestry dealers was French and Company an American antiques business which had been founded in 1907 by Mitchell Samuels and Percy French with the financial backing of Charles Mather Fulk, a millionaire wool merchant in Washington, D.C., initially as a conduit from which to sell his own tapestry holdings, which had been largely composed from the splendid collection sold by the impoverished Barberini in Rome in 1889. In this view of French and Company's showroom, you can see the Hunt Tapestry from Girona Cathedral, now in the Minneapolis Institute of Art. Even the auction house of the American Artists Association, from which, despite its name, many great tapestries were sold, mimicked a Venetian palazzo. This photograph is from the 1880s. To the experienced eye of the dealer Jacques Seligman, George Blumenthal was, quote, superior to the generality of American connoisseurs, unquote. Blumenthal's relationship with Seligman was warm enough for him to lend some of his most splendid tapestries to the great loan exhibitions which Seligman hosted in his Parisian showroom. These exhibitions were ostensibly non-commercial ventures. None of the tapestries or other works were for sale. The exhibitions claimed to be curated by luminaries of the social scene, and the proceeds went to charity, providing the host, Jacques Seligman, with a respectable veneer of philanthropy. Of course, in actuality, the shows also served as a marvelous advertisement for Seligman, reuniting many works which had passed through his hands, in doing so showcasing an impressive rota of influential former clients and, as his son Germain put it, quote, bringing the art-minded public as well as the choice collectors to Sagan, unquote. In 1913, both the Mercury and Hersey tapestries were included in an exhibition of medieval and Renaissance art, to raise funds for the French Red Cross, ostensibly organized by the Marquise de Ganet. The tapestries must doubtless have been admired there by His Majesty King Alfonso VIII of Spain, who was the guest of honor at the opening of the exhibition. And as you can see, I've just got the title page of the catalog here. Fourteen years later, Blumenthal again obliged Seligman with the loan of his splendid crucifixion, actually a French and company purchase, to the Seligman-hosted loan exhibition of religious art, organized for the benefit of the Basilica of the Sacré-Cœur and sponsored by their eminences Louis Cardinal Dubois, Archbishop of Paris, and Patrick Cardinal Hayes, Archbishop of New York. The dealer Jacques Seligman, you can see here, and the collector George Blumenthal, here, may have had such a successful relationship because they were kindred spirits, both Jewish, both born in Frankfurt in the same year, 1858. Indeed, according to Seligman's son Germain, 
they had known each other since boyhood and had been schoolmates. Certainly, George and Florence Blumenthal acquired most of their tapestries from Seligman. In addition to the two Mercury and Hersey tapestries, for example, Seligman also furnished them with these two splendid grotesque tapestries, believed to have been part of a set of bed hangings for Philip II of Spain, and based on designs attributable to Cornelis Florence. There's, there is, unfortunately, no evidence that they were ever owned by Habsburg royalty. Nonetheless, the sophistication of the weaving, appreciable in these details, the depth of the cochineal dyes, this is the cochineal area, and the wealth of gold and silver metal-wrapped threads certainly implies a patron of top caliber. These came from the Parisian collection of Baron Nathaniel de Rothschild, and Seligman had sold them to the Blumenthal's by 1912. In 1924, Seligman sold Florence Blumenthal five small tapestry panels depicting the story of Abraham, and this one shows Abraham entertaining the visiting angels. Although now recognized as fine quality weaving, probably from Brussels, at the time Seligman incorrectly labeled them tapiserie au point, or embroidery. The Blumenthal's also kept an eye on the holdings of other New York dealers. As you may recall, they had purchased both the Berwick and Alba crucifixion and the Charlemagne tapestry from French and Company. Likewise, in his diary, the dealer René Gampel noted for the entry of the 8th of April 1919, quote, I have sold the tapestry of Veronica, here it is, for $80,000 to Mrs. George Blumenthal, unquote. $80,000 in 1919, bearing in mind inflation and the comparative wage index, is approximately 600,000 euros in today's money. It is another lovely tapestry, as these details show. This slide is perhaps a little difficult to make out. What you're seeing is the, the front, the face of the tapestry, folded back so we can also see part of the reverse, and it gives you a sense of, of the splendid colors. The Blumenthal's did not, apparently, purchase any tapestries from the Duvines, which is surprising given this family's ubiquity on the art market at this time. Here, Joel Devine expounds upon a sergeant painting to King George V, <coughs> Queen Mary, and Lord Davenon. Perhaps this provides further evidence of Blumenthal's canniness. The Devine's sharp practices, sometimes bordering on the dishonest, have become infamous. For example, with reference to Arthur Lehman, another important Jewish collector in New York, and whose cousin was subsequently a significant donor to the Metropolitan Museum, Henry Devine cynically advised his nephew Joseph, quote, I advise you to take a lot of trouble with him as he has plenty of money and is buying 16th century objects from Seligman. My advice to you in selling to people like this is to first of all gain their confidence, and as they don't know anything about works of art, the idea is to educate them. Give Mr. Arthur Lehman books on tapestries and show him the why and wherefore these things were so valuable, and in this way you'll obtain his confidence." Unquote. Jacques Seligman's relationship with Duveen cooled considerably after a bitter dispute in 1901 involving the wonderful Mazarin tapestry, now in the American National Gallery of Art. After planning to sell it together as a joint venture, Duveen bought Seligman out, 
assuring him that there was no market for the tapestry, but that he would keep it as long-term stock. In fact, all the while, Devine had already found a buyer in John Pierpont Morgan and decided that, on reflection, he didn't want to share the proceeds with Seligman. Devine persuaded Morgan to pay an astronomical $500,000, approximately 8 million euros now. Even Morgan realized that the price was vastly inflated, but the snob in him was delighted at Devine's promise that, King, or that Edward VII would want to borrow the tapestry to decorate Westminster Abbey at the time of his coronation. In the event, the ensuing scandal prevented the loan. As you may recall, John Pierpont Morgan had been an important business mentor of George Blumenthal and an early influence in the field of collecting. Morgan was renowned for the zeal with which he gobbled up treasures from European collections, and this cartoon from Punch doesn't need any explanation, and for the vast sums of money which he spent on these works. Over the course of 23 years, he spent about $60 million, which is the equivalent to just under 800 million euros now, purchasing art. Not that he was alone. The publishing magnet, William Randolph Hearst, for example, was such an enthusiastic collector that when he found the ceilings of his New York apartment too low for satisfactory display of his tapestries, he purchased the entire building in order to knock out three floors of apartments to create a subtly grandiose Gothic hall. Although Mrs. Hearst later described her husband as a stingy fellow, for 50 years, he nevertheless spent an average of $1 million a year on his art collection. His castle in California, San Simeon, which you can see here, was fitted with tapestries, uh, here and here, for example. It was fitted with tapestries until he was forced to sell the lion's share after being badly hit by the Depression. In this small world, the American collectors all knew one another, and the dealers often played them off against each other. Equally, the small band of dealers was frequently pitted one against another. They were fiercely territorial of their holdings and kept a wary eye on each other's dealings. When George Blumenthal bought the Rose Garden Tapestry at the Heilbronner sale, for example, Joseph Dufine's agent cabled Dufine to remark upon the fact that Jacques Seligman had accompanied Blumenthal to the sale. When on the scent of an ancient European collection whose owners were amenable to sell, we get the impression of a pack of hounds racing on the trail. In the midst of the negotiations with the chapter of the Cathedral of Burgos for two of their splendid Redemption of Man tapestries, and this is one of them, Devine's agents cabled him to warn him that, quote, we must act quickly as Germain Seligman is now in Spain, probably after this business. Also, we must keep very much alive as Wildenstein, Lacade, and both Seligmans are searching everywhere for Gothic tapestries and they're paying a higher price than we are." Unquote. Similarly, in 1913, during an uneasy business collaboration between French and Company and Raoul Heilbronner with regards to the Duke of Sesto's Scipio tapestry, Seen here is the Scipio tapestry, subsequently sold to William Randolph Hearst, and you can see it here hanging in San Simeon. A mutual acquaintance urged Heilbronner to be candid with French and company about who had already seen the tapestries, because, quote, you know exactly what kind of people Devine and Seligman are, and if they can damage the goods by talking against them, they will certainly do so, unquote. In 1915, at John Pierpont Morgan's death, this is just a view of his library, Joseph Devine made an offer to purchase his enormous and important tapestry collection from his son. 
Devine later confided to his gallery manager that, quote, he did not reply. Two days later, I heard that Mitchell Samuels of French and Company, backed by the collector Joseph Widener, had bought the tapestries. I had lost the market for tapestries, which had been created by my father 40 years ago, and which we had held ever since. I have to do something to get it back." Unquote. But if we concentrate too much on the wily activities of the dealers and avaricious grabbing of some of the less discerning collectors like Hearst, it's easy to forget about the more noble sentiments. John Pierpont Morgan left his library of books, prints, and drawings accessible to the nation. Although he did not bequeath the lion's share of his art collection to any public institutions, he did work throughout his later life to improve the Infant Metropolitan Museum of Art, taking his duties first as a trustee and then as president of the museum seriously enough to purchase numerous works of art on the museum's behalf with his own money. This is one of those works, uh, the fragmentary Seven Sacraments Tapestry. Just as George Blumenthal had been inspired by John Pierpont Morgan, his wife Florence was spurred into the collecting field by the example of her acquaintance Isabella Stewart Gardner. And this is a portrait of Mrs. Gardner. Isabella Stewart Gardner had opened this museum, housing her art collection, in Boston in 1903 voicing her ambition that, quote, years ago, I decided that the greatest need in our country was art. We were a very young country and had very few opportunities of seeing beautiful things, works of art. So I determined to make it my life's work if I could, unquote. Amongst Isabella Stewart Gardner's treasures, were some of the tapestries from the Barberini Fulk collections, including these two fine 17th century Parisian tapestries attributed to the workshop of Raphael de la Planche. And hopefully you can make them out hanging inside the museum here. In turn, Florence Blumenthal herself would prove a positive influence on another wealthy young heiress in Chicago, Miss Kate Buckingham, who, following Florence's example, purchased works of art from Jacques Seligman, including this tapestry from around 1500, with the intention that these objects form a great Gothic hall at the center of the new Art Institute of Chicago. Like John Pierpont Morgan and Isabella Stewart Gardner, like the Huntingdons in California, like the Altmans, Lehmans, and Rockefellers in New York, George Blumenthal's desire for an old world luxury in a brand new New World mansion was tempered by a more altruistic spirit. The Frankfurt-born Blumenthal wanted to embellish his adopted country. Already in 1928, he had established and handled a fund of $1 million for the Metropolitan Museum. Here you can see the headline from 1928 from the New York Times. In 1933, he took on the role of president of the museum. Here's the announcement again in the Times. In his will, he bequeathed to the museum his entire art collection along with that New York mansion, with the understanding that the museum could demolish the house to profit from the land sale, if they so wished. Today, the Blumenthal's tapestries, paintings, sculpture, stained glass, and ceramics can be enjoyed in the Metropolitan Museum's galleries. So almost all of the objects which you see here formed part of the Blumenthal bequest. 
At the museum, we're conscious of our duty to preserve, maintain, and care for them. In our textile conservation laboratory, the condition of the tapestries is regularly checked. And I hope you'll be able to recognize you're seeing here the final tapestry from the Mercury and Hersey set, um, a glaurus turned to stone. The tapestries are checked from the broadest examination this is one of our textile conservators, Christina Carr, looking at the reverse of the um, glaurus being turned to stone. They're examined to microscopic detail. And this is a view of the same tapestry, a glaurus turned to stone, at times 10 magnification. The microscope allows the tapestry to be experienced from a whole new angle. So you, you'll probably be able to work out what we're seeing. These are the, the warps. And here, these are the wefts, so the, the colored parts building up the tapestry. And these ones here are the, the precious metal-wrapped threads. So these are the actual bands of, of silver and gilded silver wrapped around the, the yarn cores. This is at times 16 magnification. Here, you can see an additional supportive strap and a new lining applied to the reverse of mercury transforming a glaurus to stone. So this is the view of the reverse of the tapestry. This is part of the new lining, folded back slightly. This is the additional supporting strap, helping to, to bear the stresses and weight of the tapestry. And just through here, you see a little gap with part of the reverse of the tapestry on view. Previous repair work, perhaps dating from Blumenthal's acquisition of the tapestry, is carefully left in place and stabilized. So I hope you can make it out. So again, this is a very detailed view of the reverse. So here we're seeing part of the reverse of the tapestry, the, the actual weaving. And these patches here, these, these beige marks, are part of the, the repair works of a, a conservation campaign, which had actually been sewn through a backing. So rather than repair those, what our conservatives have done is very carefully worked around them to preserve them, but to stabilize and consolidate the condition of the tapestry. From the beginning, it seems, the Blumenthal's had envisaged their collection passing into the public sphere. This is revealed in a remark made by Florence already in 1919. However, her comment is perhaps more interesting and certainly more poignant as an explanation for the motivation which drove the Blumenthal's to collect in the first place. She declares, quote, I'm rich, pampered, elegant, and people think I'm happy. How can I be? I've lost my son. The child whom I created is dead. So I had to create something else, and I made this house. A personality of stone. We'll bequeath it, along with the collection, to the city of New York. But its spirit will be gone, for these rugs caress the stones below. The familiars of all this furniture they adorn will have to be put away protected behind thick glass." Unquote. And indeed, 90 years later, the Blumenthal's two Mercury and Hersey tapestries hang in the Metropolitan Museum's Northern Renaissance Gallery. You can see the bridal chamber of Hersey here. Having seen so many former owners, from Francisco Gomez de Sandoval y Rojas, the 16th century Duke of Medina Theli, to the 20th century Mrs. Blumenthal, and having journeyed across the centuries, from Brussels to Valladolid to New York, the tapestries can now be admired daily and anew by visitors to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Thank you very much. <laughs>